So with that, I think we will get started. And I um, want to say hello to all the listeners out there. It's noon here in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, and I'd like to welcome you to our November webinar. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor with Horde Dairyman. I have the pleasure of co-hosting this webinar with the great Mike Hutchins from the University of Illinois. We are proud to bring you today's webinar on moving toward longer lasting cows. Presenting will be Dr. Frank Gary from the University of Colorado. Dr. Gary is a fantastic presenter and he has a great message today for all of you on thinking critically about death losses and premature calls from the herd. We're very excited to have him here with us today. We've been holding these webinars for four years now on the second Monday of each month at noon central time. I want to extend our many thanks to Jim Balls, our webinar producer, who's also with the University of Illinois, for all his technological support in helping put these events together. At this time, I'll hand the microphone over to Mike Hutchins, who will introduce our speaker and help get the webinar off to a good start. Very good, Abby. Well, thanks very much, and we're very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Frank Gehry uh, to our webinar here. Uh, Frank grew up in upstate New York, received his bachelor's and DVM degrees from Cornell University, and an MS from The Ohio State University, who appears now to be number one in the, in, in the Big Ten. He practiced in upstate New York and did his clinical training in Germany and at The Ohio State University. He is a specialist in the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine and currently is professor at at Colorado State University, where he is in the Department of Clinical Sciences since 1987. In 1996, he became the coordinator of the Integrated Livestock Management Program at Colorado State University. So, uh, Dr. Gary, we welcome you to our program, and the webinar is yours. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And should I, can I now move the, oops, I got to use something to advance the slide. Let me see. Oops, it didn't advance. There we go. I've got it. Um, thank you very much. I, I want to start first by thanking Steve Larson and the whole um, Horde Steerman crew for the invitation. I want to thank uh, uh, you folks for joining, and I want to thank Jim Baltz for doing a really great job on upgrading my slides from the version that I had to something that's really way more presentable here. And then lastly, I want to comment on the Integrated Livestock Management Program, which is uh, an initiative is a graduate studies initiative that focuses on taking very bright, really eager, motivated graduate students and focusing them on problems that occur in the real world of livestock agriculture in the field. And the reason I mention that here is specifically because there are several people that have been involved with me in, in working on issues that relate to mortality. And a specific graduate student, Dr. Craig McConnell, is responsible for most of the data that I'll show you that's generated here at Colorado State University that I'll present here. So um, very important to recognize the contributions that those people have made. I'll start with asking the question of how big of a problem is dairy animal mortality? And I will um, suggest that, I, that I'm going to focus mostly on the mortality component because it's the most extreme bad outcome that can occur to a dairy cow. But I want to also say that along the way I'll refer some to culling because culling is um, intimately related to mortality. In other words, um, there are many cows that leave dairies because of issues that are not just economic decisions. I think it's been common in the industry and for uh, producers as well as some people, you know, some of the academics that, that talk with the industry to look at culling as an economic decision, so to speak. That can be true and certainly some cows are removed just because people uh, feel it's a good idea. What I'll ask you to do is to think clearly about how many cows are removed from your dairy because you had a full barn or because it just made some economic sense versus you had to remove them because if you didn't, a really bad problem would occur. And the bad problem is typically then manifest as mortality. When we ask that question, there aren't really good data sets that have actually tracked this substantially over long periods of time. My best go-to resource for this are the NOMS, the National Animal Health Monitoring System surveys that are done across the industry. And starting in 1996 through to 2007, these are the producer responses that you can see here that show very substantially rising rates of mortality through that 10, 11 year period of time. 
At the present time, the Dairy 2014 study is going on, and um, it will be interesting to see what those results are, whether it has escalated yet further than that. An important thing to know about these types of studies, however, is that these types of studies are based on a producer response to a survey. They're not based on just tallies, and so they're what producers tell us is the mortality rate. It's interesting to then look at actual records. These are records that were uh, uh, provided to me courtesy of DHI Provo. Um, and these show a similar but actually perhaps a more significant story. If you look at this graph, what I'd like you to get out of it is that when you look at total herd removals by cause, this is specific to the western dairy states that report to DHI Provo, you'll notice that cows that die, that, that death, is the second leading cause of removal from permanent removal from the herd. We can look at that a little more closely over a period of time. Here's a 10 year time span from 1991 through 2002. What I want you to take away from these data is that over that period of time, total removals, as seen here in the top end of the bar, remain relatively consistent around, say, 35%. Okay. I want you to now focus on this part of the bar down here, which is those removals that are attributable to death loss. I'm going to expand to that. This is that same graph, but just looking exclusively at the, at the death losses and see in that same period of time that basically in those states that report, the eight western states that, uh, from which those data come, um, we have essentially a doubling of the death loss. That's pretty dramatic. If we look this would be data from 2008, so getting closer to where we are now, actually the uh, reporting from 2007, and we look at individual states. I want you to see that, in fact, culling and mortality, the culling being the purple bar, the mortality being the blue bar, um, mortality as a percentage of culling is actually very, very substantial, similar to that first graph that I showed you. I also want you to see another relationship that on average for states that cull very deep, let's say these here, their mortality rates tend to be low. In other words, part of the way you control mortality is by removing cows before they die. In my mind, this is not a solution of the problem because it suggests that a substantial percentage of the cows that are removed from dairies have to be removed because otherwise they're in very, very deep trouble. The overall mortality rate across these states was 9%. Okay? Let's look over a more protracted, prolonged time period, and you'll see here's that same trend from 93 through to about 04, 05. You see rising rates of mortality. Um, if you look here from about, oh, say, 07, 08, you can see that the total removals go up. You folks will know that this is related to many features of dairy production, including cull cow um, prices, uh, milk prices, other economic shifts within the industry. And you'll notice that if we cull really deep as these go up, now we can bring mortality rates down. But we still remain in the fairly high single digits here. And again, it suggests that there's not only a relationship between culling and mortality, but that many of the calls that are leaving have to leave the dairy because they are what some people call broken cows. This is not a, a phenomenon that is unique to the Western states. Here are data that were assembled by my colleague, Dr. Rogers, Gary Rogers, who used to be a professor at the um, University of Tennessee. He's a geneticist. He now works for Geno Global. He assembled a very substantial database from the Dairy Records Management Systems, DRMS. This is all based on eastern states. And these are cows born since 1980, 1.1 million cows. I will show you later a slide that comes from 29 herds that represent 35,000 cows to compare Holsteins with Jerseys. And these are herds with 10 or more years of continuous recording. So this is very substantial database. Here's the data that he comes up with in the time frame from 1982 through 2005. The blue is lactation 1, red lactation 2, and the yellow lactation 3 plus. You'll notice that across all parity groups throughout a fairly substantial period of time, certainly 20 years plus, the dairy industry in these states has seen a rising rate of mortalities, which may be leveling off here towards the early 2000s, but the point is that these are pretty substantial mortality rates in these herds. So what I hope you might be asking yourself is, well, if that's true, what's normal? What, what should we reasonably expect? And the fact is that that's not a really easy question to answer. As it turns out, 
focusing on how many cows die on a dairy has not been a very popular thing to do. Here's one particular citation from the literature. We looked hard when we started getting involved in mortality research in the mid-2000s, about 2005. And what we found, it was, here was one standout publication from 2006. And these gentlemen, Doxers Thompsons and Huey from Denmark, um, did a review of all the literature that they could find for the last 40 years. In the 40-year time frame from 65 to 2006, there were only 19 total studies that included information within the dairy industry about cow mortality. Ten of those gave information about the causes of death. The other nine didn't. It just said, what is the rate? Most of these studies were from outside the United States, and the review suggests that 1 to 5 percent would have been a typical mortality range over that period of time. Most of our data, when we look at it, suggests that rates down around 3 percent, maybe as low as 2, would have been historical norms not that terribly long ago. By comparison, here are data that were generated by another of our colleagues, Dr. Stone, Bill Stone, who at the time that he worked in Cornell University. And so this was, I think, a study that he reported in 2005. What he did is he went to 21 different dairy herds, and each of those herds is represented here. What I'd like you to see here is the extreme variation in rates of death loss, some up into the mid-teens, some down around, say, 3%, 3 to 4%. In other words, there's not only a wide variation, but there are herds that actually can maintain death losses down at a much lower level than the average, which is here in the mid to high single digits. Okay? My point here is that there aren't a lot of data on normal losses. Um, there are no benchmarks that have been historically established. It has not been carefully monitored. And it appears as though over the last at least 20 years, these rates have been increasing and in many herds and, and even in some states, averaging somewhere in the high single digits, like 8 to 10 percent. This is a very striking thing because I'm going to I, I don't have a chance to ask this, but I will guess that most of the participants on this webinar would agree with me that it is a fact that death is the single most costly cause of, of herd removal. In other words, regardless of the economics, regardless of, of cull cow prices, a cow that dies on the farm is the worst possible way to remove a cow from the herd. Furthermore, I will consider it a statement of fact that when death losses occur, they reveal significant health and welfare issues on the dairy, at least at the individual cow level. And this is a significant thing because if death losses are down at 1 or 2 percent, those are individuals who had significant health problems. When they start moving up from there, it suggests that there are some things that probably should be managed a lot more closely than they are because we shouldn't have, I, I would argue, uh, death losses in that high single digit range. So that leads to our first polling question. How high are the annual adult cow death losses on your farm as a percentage of average inventory? And I will say, I, I probably should have mentioned this in those first slides, when I calculate a percent, this is the industry standard, we're looking at the number of cows that die as a percentage of the average inventory over a year. And so here I've listed two to three, four to six, six to eight, eight percent or greater, or I don't know. Well, Frank, we, uh, we've got the polls open now, and so uh, all you should be voting. We're well over 100 people here, almost 120. So we'll see how good a voting we have here today compared to the election we had last Tuesday. According to President Obama, only one-third of the people voted. So I hope we can, we can, we can beat that as far as that goes. Uh, Frank, you may want to just move your microphone back just a little bit. We're getting a little bit of popping on this end here. Okay. So maybe we'll let you... Back it up a little bit, and why don't you say a few words, and we'll see if you're still popping. Okay. Does that sound better now? Oh, yeah. Vastly okay. better. Much better. I may be well, too close to my mouth. Well, we're at 53%, and uh, and uh, now we're up to almost 60 here. We're only going to give it about another few seconds, and we're going to close the poll as far as that goes and uh, see what we have. And so we're we're going slowly here. Uh, we're at 62%, and the poll's closed, and Jim is sharing it. Uh, Frank, can you see it now to see what, yes. uh, what those numbers I are? Can. And can what? I assume, I should have asked this before, can the participants see what those results are as well as me? Yes, yep, they can Great. all, everybody can see it, so. Great. Um, well, this is actually, I, I'll comment on this. 
I'm encouraged to see that very few people said seven or, or excuse me, eight percent or greater. Um, our data suggests that, in fact, a fair number of dairies actually are at eight percent or greater. We can't end up with averages in the neighborhood of six percent or seven percent unless, of course, there's a fair number of herds higher than that. Um, but maybe we have the best producers listen to the webinar, so that would be great. The other thing that strikes me here is the percentage of people, which is almost a quarter, 22 percent, who don't know. And if I were to stop the webinar right here and encourage everybody to take the time in their record keeping and in their monthly monitoring or weekly monitoring to pay attention to this number, I think we'd have done a good job with this webinar. Because a lot of what goes on with mortality, um, as I will try and portray in the remainder of the, of the webinar, um, is a matter of managing on the basis of good information. And if you don't know how many cows are dying on the dairy, then you can't be managing around uh, what those potential causes are. Um, let's go on though because as at the beginning I said that culling and mortality are closely related. This slide I'm showing you here is a classic veterinary student slide that we use to teach veterinarians about health issues on dairies, um, actually in almost any population, and suggest that the distribution of disease within a herd can be seen like an iceberg. In this case, the clinical disease is the tip of the iceberg. And clinical disease occurs when there's a lot of other problems occurring below it. And that the bulk of a problem for any clinical problem is actually the part of the iceberg that is submerged. When we look economically, we always see, this would be true for mastitis, this is true for Yoni's disease, true for salmonellosis, true for um, calf problems, etc. In almost any disease scenario, the clinical disease that we see is actually an indicator of a deeper problem that doesn't get quite as bad in a much more substantial number of animals. In human populations, this would be similar to the flu, okay? So if that's true, and if we look at the clinical manifestation of a bad outcome as being death of a cow, then it suggests that within the herd, there are substantial health problems that are going on that should be seen, focused on, and managed around to decrease mortality, but more importantly, to improve the overall well-being of the herd, okay? So that is the question to me, and this is phrasing uh, from my colleague and friend, Dr. Temple Grandin, who works with us here at Colorado State University, and she uses a phrase that says, you know there's a problem when bad becomes normal. I will suggest that for any of the older members of this audience, people like me or Mike Hutchins, we will remember times when um, the death loss on dairies was so small that any producer or almost any producer could identify easily um, how many cows had died on the farm that year. Now part of that is a herd size phenomenon, but part of it is a focus that, wow, a cow dying on the farm is a really bad outcome. And I will ask the question for you to, to, to muse on for yourself. Is it possible that because of all of the complexities of the way the dairy industry moves forward, that in fact, accepting that some cows are going to die has become a fairly normal phenomenon such that we haven't paid attention to the fact that these rates have raised? If that is true, then that is something I think that, should, that needs to be corrected. We shouldn't allow bad to become normal. So that should introduce the next question, which is, well, then why do dairy cows die on operations? Well, there's a number of ways that we can look at this. I'm going to highlight two of them up front, and then I'll actually focus on a third. The first one is the viewpoint that someone would have if they were a geneticist. My colleague, Dr. Rogers, loaned me this slide and set of talking points. So these aren't mine. These are the talking points of, of a well-respected geneticist in the dairy industry. And he suggests that one of the problems that causes or is, is an underlying problem behind death losses is that we haven't really focused on animal health as a component of genetic selection. That there have been many generations of selection for yield with very little selection for health and fertility. And as evidence for that, he suggests that up through even 1994, we weren't really looking at productive life or somatic cell score, that pregnancy rate and calving traits weren't added until the 2000s, and that it remains true that there are not breeding value, values available for a variety of other disease conditions. 
To that end, he offers this slide. Again, this is from Dr. Rogers. And in those 29 herds with 35,000 cows where Holsteins and Jerseys were managed on the same operation with similar overall management, that in this case, the odds ratio for Holsteins to die in the first and second lactation was substantially higher than for Jerseys. So in other words, Dr. Rogers is going to argue that a primary component of this death loss is a genetic thing. I'm going to say, I'll give you that. I'm sure that there are some genetic aspects of this problem. But I'm going to take these data, again from Dr. Bill Stone, and I'll add to them later with the data that we've generated here at Colorado State. And I'm going to say, look at these data. This is 21 herds. This is broken down into bars for cows that die in the first five days postpartum, six to 50 days postpartum, greater than 50 days postpartum. What do I want you to see here? The extreme diversity in when cows die. This is not primarily a genetic problem. This is a management problem. The only way I can explain this amount of variation in a population of cows that otherwise has strong genetic similarity is because these farms are very different. I'm going to suggest that we should be aspiring to be this farm, number 11, as opposed to this farm, number 5 and number 12. And I think that that goes to management. So the question will be, what are the management features that promote either very low death losses and extremely good animal health versus more excessive death losses and concerns about subclinical disease? A second viewpoint that we could take instead of genetics is to look at some population characteristics. In fact, numerous people now over the last 10 years have started doing this. This, this issue has caught more attention because it's very striking. And so most of the studies that have now been published in the literature in these last 10 years include looking at populations and what the predispositions are for herds that have higher rates of mortality. And they include things like parity. Older cows die more frequently than younger cows. Age. Disease prevalence. Herds with higher disease prevalence tend to have higher death rates. Days in milk, which is influential. I'll show you a better graph of this in a minute. Let's look at some management environmental factors, things like open herd status, meaning that we bring more cows into the herd, therefore potentially introducing more disease. Seasonal patterns, nutrition, and some genetics. Here, for example, is a study, these are the results of the NOMS Dairy 2007 study that are uh, published by Dr. McConnell. Um, if you look, larger herds tend to have higher mortality rates based on this one uh, uh, set of data. Okay? If we have greater number of cows for employees, um, we have greater mortality rates between 5.5 five to 7.1. If we have longer calving intervals, higher mortality rates. Fed and mixed, total mixed ration, in other words, more intensive dairy production methodologies, higher mortality rates. We can look at specific diseases, herds where we have known higher prevalences of salmonella, um, more prevalence of Yoni's disease, free stall barns, concrete basis for cow walking, and open herds that bring more cows into the operation all have higher mortality rates. We could look at other features of the herd and of the, of the animals that, that move through it. This is um, cows based on postpartum time to death. And you'll see that more cows die early in the postpartum period than later in the postpartum period. Here's a survey that we did in Colorado. Dr. McConnell, this is part of his PhD research. We surveyed over 50% of all the dairies in Colorado. We come up with a very similar distribution. In 15 days in milk or less, about a quarter of the cows that will die, die during that time. And then we decrease the percentage that die afterwards. Now these are interesting facts, but the problem is that these things are associations. They don't provide cause and effect. I can't tell you that because there is salmonella in the herd, that's what kills the cows. I can't tell you that because somebody feeds TMR, that's what kills the cows. I can't tell you that because they are recently fresh, that's what kills the cows. But more importantly, these type of data don't help you. How would you respond to these data? Would you therefore not freshen cows anymore because when they're postpartum, that's when they're more likely to die? Well, clearly not. So we need a different take on this. These are interesting pieces of information. And if you are a researcher and you're looking to get at where would I pursue the problem, these are very important observations. But for a dairy producer, these don't help you because are you going to suddenly make your herd smaller so that your death loss is lower? I don't think so. So we need to look at some other type of a way to pursue this problem. So with that, I'll ask the next polling question. 
how is it important to you to know what causes cows to die on your farm? And I'll give you the options of not at all, somewhat important, very important, or I've never really thought about it. Okay, we're uh, we're got our polls open again, and let's see how we're doing. Oh man, we're re the, the the Republicans are are really coming forward now. We're up to almost sixty percent here, uh, in a matter of seconds here, uh, Frank. I tell you, we we've got them we got them trained as far as that goes. <laughs> Um, we want you to, uh, whatever you moved, we want you to split the difference, Jim said. So if you move back two inches, we want you to move up one inch, Gary, to get you a little bit louder, but not get you popping. A little louder. So this is better? Yep. I'm Sounds hoping. really good. All right. And there's no popping either. Well, well we let's have another close. poll question, so we'll have another chance for it. All right, let's close the these makers. polls off, Jim. We don't want to take too much of uh, Frank's time here. So we're closing the poll at 72%. Those Democrats are laggers. Wow, we pretty interesting. That's um, good. Well, and I'm glad to see it. I'm gratified to see this response. Ninety-five percent say it's very important. And I'm guessing we have a biased audience here because if they didn't think it was important, they probably wouldn't have tuned into this webinar. Nevertheless, I, I agree, obviously. And so that's what we're going to pursue next is how would we then pursue this problem? I And, and I'll reiterate, we participate in those types of studies that looks at herd characteristics. Um, I think those are important data to have. I think they tell us a lot about the ultimate associations that we need to uh, look at more closely, like what happens with cows that arrive at farms? What happens as we expand herds? What happens in the immediate postpartum period that puts cows at risk? Those are good areas to study, but I'd rather look at how do we give a producer the tools to decrease the death loss on their farm as of like now, today, okay? So towards that end, there are a number of things that we already know. In fact, I would argue that every dairy producer knows this, that there are potential contributors to dairy cow death. These would include a bunch of subclinical disorders, things like hypocalcemia, rumen acidosis, negative energy balance, poor immune function, feed problems. We know that there are a bunch of clinical disease problems or issues that contribute to increased risk of death, calving injuries, ketosis, metabolic disease, mastitis, milk fever. We know that there are diseases, when I say disease X, meaning choose your disease, hemorrhagic bowel disease or some other horrible outcome. We know that those increase risk of death. And we, of course, know that downer cows um, potentially are, are not potentially, are most commonly now euthanized on farm. On this note, I should observe that when you looked at those graphs before, I've had people query me and say, well, maybe, Frank, this is related to the 2003-04 regulation that said downer cows should be euthanized on farm. If you look back, which you can do at the end of this webinar, at the slides I showed you, look at the curve as it goes through 2003-2004. There was not a stable mortality and all of a sudden it jumped up 2 or 3%. That was a continual curve. In fact, I would argue that the need to euthanize cows due to being downers really didn't influence it all that substantially much. On the other hand, if you argue that it did, then I would say, well, that's great, then why do you have so many downer cows? So we didn't really dodge the bullet because any of these things are potential concerns and downer cows are just one more contributor to the potential reasons cows die on farm. So that gets us to how we might pursue this further. We know why cows could die. In fact, we know something about the things that make them die, uh, that, that, that cause death on farms. Interestingly enough, prior to the study that we published in the Journal of Dairy Science a few years back, not one single published study in the literature that we could find reports necropsy findings. In other words, necropsies aren't done much on farms. Only one study in that 40-year period distinguished euthanasia versus unassisted death. And interestingly, producers keep track within their records on almost all farms of reason for cow removal, including death, and will typically attribute cows to different categories. So if I go to a dairy, I can usually pull up some cause of death that looks something like this report that came on the Dairy 2007 study. Things like cause of death, respiratory, I'm going to ask you the question, what the heck does this mean? What does it mean to say the cow died of digestive? You see, if you ask me as a consulting veterinarian to help you with your problem, and the only reporting in your record systems are these generic categories that I can't really tell the difference between infectious enteritis versus a surgery gone bad versus an abomasal volvulus versus uh, peritonitis, I can't really help you with the problem. This record-keeping system 
while it takes a lot of energy, I will suggest is not particularly useful. Here's another big one, the leading cause. I think this is one telling thing in this producer reported survey is lameness or injury which suggests to me that on a lot of dairies there are things going on on the dairy that potentially could be re-evaluated and made more cow friendly to decrease the rate of lameness and injury. This could be facilities, this could be cow management. So there's data, we can take some information here, but what I will suggest is that on average this doesn't help me much, particularly when these two bottom categories amounting to about 25 percent basically don't even tell me what the reason is. Okay, So I think our records need to be improved. The learning issues I want you to focus on here are that we have to pay more attention to subclinical disease, we have to pay more attention to individual cows and what the reason is that they either left the herd or died, and we have to improve the information that enters the records because the categorical information we currently put in the records is not useful for making changes. We have these very powerful computer systems but if we populate them with not particularly meaningful information, then we can't pull meaningful information back out. Okay? So, how should we approach the problem of why dairy cows die? I guess my next question, which is my next polling question is, what percent of cows that die on your farm are examined by necropsy? More than 50, 30 to 50, 10 to 30, less than 10, or not? Wow, this will be interesting. I bet this goes a little slower. We got votes coming in, though. We still have uh, almost 120 voters out there, and uh, we're zipping right along here at about 40 40 percent at this point. Frank, sound, you sound really good. The Jim is smiling oh, over good. here. So, so we're uh, wherever you got the microphone. Don't Leave move. Don't hiccup. Don't move your chair. Just uh, <laughs> just sit there. Just sit there. I hope I don't cough. <laughs> <laughs> Well, worse things could happen. Worse yeah. things can happen. Okay, we seem to be uh, slowing down here on the voting here. I'm not sure if people aren't sure or don't want to vote here, but uh, I think we're going to cut her off at uh, 60%, and it's closed. We're at 60%, and uh, we're interesting. Uh, okay. Wow. Yeah, so and I'm going to show you a couple slides later on that validate that in, in this particular case, um, I think the, the participants mimic what goes on in most of the dairy industry. We have data from that, both from the survey and from our own studies, and it suggests that 50% of people doing fewer than 10% necropsies and 29% doing none is very typical within the industry. And so it's not going to be a big mystery to you. One of the things I'm going to recommend is that we have a strategy for and actually follow through on pursuing the causes of death loss at a more avid level, including necropsy as a component of that because if you don't do the necropsy you're not going to have the information you need. So let's focus on that for a little bit. One of the, the things that we did first as we pursued this was to ask the question when producers do list the cause of death in these dairy records. I already critiqued to the use of categories that I don't think are particularly useful but a further component of that is who actually lists what goes into that category. For almost all dairies who list that is of course dairy personnel, the owner or the manager. And what we wanted to know is when producers list that, are their assessments accurate? Okay, so we did a study where we looked at the producer reasons for death and we challenged producers to list the reason for cows dying and then we went ahead and did a necropsy on the cow. And um, they listed the, the uh, cause of death before we did the necropsy or, or without knowing what we found on the necropsy. In this case, even with producers who were very keyed in, like they knew they were being tested, 24% of the cases were reported as unknown by the producer. After a necropsy, 4% were unknown. Not, necropsy doesn't always give you the cause of death, but even a field necropsy gives you a cause of death that you can list um, much more commonly than just guessing. Okay? Of the causes given by the producer, 55% were correct. In other words, generally speaking, producers only write about half the time. But that wasn't random. For accidents, about 100% or 100% were correct, which is a way of saying if somebody runs a cow over with a skid loader and you're obliged to euthanize her, you don't need a necropsy. You know why she died. For locomotive problems, the majority were correct. But if we excluded them, now we're down to only 40% correct. If we took out those where the producer euthanized the cow after substantial treatment, Producers were generally correct about 80% of the time for those deaths, but if we excluded all of them, now producers were only correct on their assessment about a third of the time. So that says that 
a lot of times when we think we know what causes cows to die, we're wrong, okay? And it's not the things you don't know that can hurt you as much as the things you're sure you know that aren't true, okay? So if we're going to change management, we need to recognize that dairies are very complex entities. They have complex personnel, facilities, groups, movement. The cows themselves are complex. I mean, they live out their entire lives in the dairy. And mortality is complex. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why cows die. Therefore, if a cow dies after breathing hard and it's listed as RESP, this does not help much because it does not really tell you that the cow died of respiratory disease. Why do cows die? If you really want to know, somebody, and if it's not the veterinarian, then it needs to be somebody on farm, needs to open the cow up. That's how you actually find out. So I find it to be very telling. These are data from, again, the NOMS Dairy 2007 study. And you will see that for unweaned heifers, weaned heifers, and cows, looking across all operations, less than 5% of animals in the dairy industry receive a necropsy after death to determine what the cause of death was. So our participants were actually very close to target in terms of what most producers tell us in large-scale surveys. In the dairy survey that we did in the state of Colorado, here is what we found. 14% of the producers we surveyed didn't know how many cows were necropsied. In other words, very few. 29% did no adult cow necropsies. Very, almost exactly the same as what we found with our little poll that we just did. And 70% performed 10% or fewer. So in other words, what the participants showed was exactly what the producers in Colorado told us was the case um, in our state. Okay? So let's say that we did necropsies. Let's say that I convinced you that it would be a good idea to know why cows die. Here's the type of results you would get across the herd. There's about 34 reasons that we could define why cows die, and no one single piece of this pie is actually big enough to cause you to change something in your management. So, when I look at necropsy, I've got a good news and a bad news story. The good news, necropsy is the only way to accurately assess the proximate cause of death, because it describes a disease process and it's a relatively straightforward procedure. Okay, even if you didn't do advanced diagnostics, generally speaking, a well-trained veterinarian or technical person can say, aha, it did have respiratory infection or it did not. Okay, the bad news. When you do do necropsies, you end up with more detail that can be managed. If you entered into your record systems 34 different diagnoses, then you'd have more information than you actually can use. That makes it difficult to categorize this information. And in the end, if you end up categorizing it as RESP or digestive, this doesn't get you further down the, down the line. Furthermore, it doesn't include the other critical information of why the cow died. So a necropsy is a, is a grossly underutilized tool on dairies. Information about cause of death without necropsy is a guess. Sorry, but that's just true. Our data say that your guess is not really very accurate much of the time. And information about bad incomes and current records is not useful, so we need a better system. And I'm going to suggest that we not only need more necropsies, but we need to pair the necropsy information with something else. Because without um, good information, you can't direct management changes to correct the problem. And I will suggest that on the dairies, I'll just tell you, that on the dairies where we've done extensive necropsy uh, diagnoses of death, Death losses decrease. Why? Because producers armed with information tend to make changes in their management that decrease the death loss. And there's no one single thing they do. It's a group of different things. In order to get that information, we need the proximate cause of death. That's what we get on a necropsy. But you need to match that with historical events, and it needs to be done on the individual animals as they either are removed from the herd or die. Okay? What I'm telling you is a story that most of you are very familiar with. If you watch TV, or perhaps your family watches TV, you will be familiar with a series of shows that are on TV called CSI, or perhaps Law and & Order, and here's what those guys do. The, the people in those shows are some kind of Sherlock Holmes or a sleuth. They don't just ask, did the cow die? They ask, who, what, when, where, why, and how, okay? And here's what that means. In one of those shows, if they find a man dead in the street with a hole in his chest from a bullet, lying in a pool of blood, we know at a certain level why the, why the guy died. But that doesn't help us prevent the next guy from dying the same unless we ask questions about what, where, why, how, 
it makes a big difference whether that guy got shot because he was in a drive-by shooting, because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, because he was in the middle of a bad drug deal, because he was cheating on his wife, um, or because he loaned the wrong people money, or he was, you know, whatever those causes are. It makes a big difference. We can't prevent that death, even though we know the proximate cause of death without other information. And I would suggest that in our current record systems, we don't track that very well. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple cases in point. Here's tag number 9813 on a dairy. It's a fourth lactation cow. So she's an older cow. She's a tall skinny cow, as it turns out, 13 days in milk, recently postpartum. She staggers um, out onto the concrete and um, is down, and therefore she is euthanized. When we do the necropsy, we find a spinal fracture towards the uh, back end of the cow, sort of north near the pelvis, and so we pursue it. Now, if all we knew was she went down, your current record system would tell me down, euthanized. This doesn't help me much. If I now pursue it and I say, aha, down because of the neurologic disease associated with the fracture, I have a specific type of an injury. I now pursue it and I say, when? It was after the second milking as the cow was exiting the parlor. Until I get this far, working with farm personnel, I do not know that the reason the cow had a fracture was because somebody in the pit was hurrying to push cows through because they'd gotten a signal from the owner that said we need to do a certain number of turns and therefore the animal was crushed with the hydraulic breast gate. This was the third such cow. After identifying what the cause was, no more cows die on that dairy for that reason because these can be prevented. Let's look at a different case in point. Here's tag 732. She's a first lactation animal. You'll notice she's 28 months old. She's 13 days in the milk. She's euthanized following recumbency, following a loss of condition. The necropsy shows us three diagnoses. In your current system, you would say, oh, well, she was breathing hard, or I thought she had metabolic disease. So she might be listed as metabolic. She might be listed as RESP. She did indeed have bronchopneumonia, liver disease, and metritis, infectious disease. What's important is that we put all this together and say, you know, this animal was an older animal. During severe and climate weather, she was purchased in an overconditioned state. She didn't get enough feed. Therefore, she ended up with significant metabolic disease. And then that potentiated these other infectious problems. This is a multifactorial transition failure because it wasn't seen that she was in trouble at an early enough stage. These can all be changed. All these decisions can be made different. But you would need to pursue it like Sherlock Holmes in order to actually say, you know, that's the fifth cow like that we've had. And you could change your buying strategy or your warm-up strategy or the transition cow strategy. All those things are subjective, are, are uh, uh, potential for management. So we can construct a different way to enter information. We could look at specific disease processes that are important to you. We could enter in the records things that suggest that the disease was not recognized early enough. We could suggest specific areas where trauma occurs, where we could improve it. We can look at multifactorial failures. We can look at feed management things because we can develop a record keeping system that tells us what we want to know. So I'm going to conclude the, the presentation with the following very specific recommendations. Hopefully, if you've tracked this far, I have convinced you and I, I hope you're going to walk away knowing that cow mortality is an important thing to pay attention to on farms. I will ask that the, say that the first step in combating this problem is to commit to evaluating, monitoring, and decreasing the occurrence. If you do nothing else but at least pay attention to what goes into the records, identifying what your current rate of mortality is, and then saying, I think this could be improved, I would have done you a good service. The second step, formulate a strategy for performing more thorough postmortem examinations. I do not believe that you need to necropsy every single dead cow on the place. As I showed you, there are certain cows where we all can agree, you know, the injury cow that's euthanized, we know exactly why that took place. There the issue is how we record the death, not whether we knew what caused it. But we need to target deaths outside the obvious. For most dairies, this means cows that had bad outcomes following treatment or where we didn't actually even suspect that the cow was going to die to begin with. For those of you who have not done a lot of necropsies, we've made available on our website some directed learning things that will help producers get their hands around necropsies. I should add that as a veterinarian, I am well aware that if my producers and the producers I work with call me up every time a cow dies, I will fail you sometimes. 
because I'll be unavailable, I'll be busy, I'll be doing something else. I would recommend that the place to start is for producers to communicate with veterinarians and say, we need to know more about why cows die. And either the, the veterinarian can come do the necropsies or somebody technically trained can do the necropsies. I would even suggest that dairy personnel can do necropsies, that you then share that information with the veterinarian. In other words, if somebody else isn't available, it is not that hard to open a cow up and say the cow did have this disease or did not have this disease. Capture the information with uh, 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 images and send it on your cell phone. Third, I'm going to suggest that you incorporate employees routinely into the process because one, watching why cows die is an important teaching tool. Second, it stimulates interest in addressing the problem. Third, as the veterinarian, it, it allows me to work with the people who actually work with cows on the farm and have communications and discussions, and that's how I find out that the cow get crushed by the breast gate. That's how I know when the cow was actually identified to be sick. That's how I figure out who actually recognized the problem early enough or did not. In other words, it, it stimulates a better communication between me as the veterinarian and the people on the farm that are actually working with the cows. Okay? Fourth. Utilize hard copies of these records to capture the detail. And I think we, we actually, in the next couple months, you will see an article in uh, Hordes Dairyman, which will present you with a thing that we call the Dairy Cow Certificate of Death. And I'd recommend that you use a format like that to record the dynamic aspects of why cows die so that you have a better tracking system with information that is useful to you. I suggest you use digital photos for clarification and to communicate with your veterinarian, and that you have organized necropsy sheets with the digital photography. My last comment, I would suggest that you standardize health and nomenclature for your dairy. In other words, if you believe, if you see that there are problems with calving injuries, that the animal is identified as having died from a very specific problem that you believe can be managed better on your farm. Code the deaths based on those categories, so communicating with me as your veterinarian, we can now work together and say, you know, we can improve this with worker training, or we can improve this with some other thing. We can improve this with facilities change. And then record that specific reason on the on-farm computer systems so we can see a year down the road whether we actually impacted it in a positive. Um, my last comment comes from, I'm sorry, the attribution was removed here from one of my heroes. Dr. Albert Einstein, who said problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. I think we have a problem here that's created because of the level of focus and the attention that has been given. I think if we shift our focus and look at the question differently, we can easily solve the problem of uh, increased levels of mortality on dairy farms. And with that, that's what I had to present, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Well, very good, Frank. Uh, why don't you click to the next PowerPoint, and Abby, we'll let you kind of summarize a little bit here before we go to the Q&A, okay? Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Dr. Gary, for a great presentation and really some food for thought for all the producers and listeners out there when we think about death losses on the farm and what we can do to evaluate them and minimize them in the future. Um, for all of you that are listening, this webinar will be posted on live in our archives, so you will be able to listen to that in the future if you'd like to review it again. Um, this webinar and all of our past webinars can be found at www.hordes.com slash webinars. We also want to let you know that you will be receiving a seven-question survey in your email later this week. That survey will give you an opportunity to evaluate today's presenter and the topic. Your feedback is always appreciated as this helps us to plan for the year ahead. And also in that email will be a link to the archive presentation, so you as a participant will have access to that before the rest of um, the world out there. So we also hope that you'll make plans to attend our next webinar, which will take place on Monday, December 8th. This webinar will feature strategies to enhance teat health and milk quality during the winter months, which will be here before we know it. Um, that webinar will be presented by Leo Timms from, the from Iowa State University and will be sponsored by Kuhn North America. Okay, I guess we are all set then to go to our Q&A. We had a very early question came in here, uh, Dr. Gary, about why is mortality higher in TMR-fed cows versus uh, component or separate-fed cows on farms? 
Well, so uh, am I live now? I can answer that question? Yep. Oh, you're okay. live all the time. Well, first of all, I'll say there's a darn good question. But second, I'll say that's part of why the type of information we generate in those surveys um, is not useful at the farm level. When we look at the questions like that, we're not saying that it's cause and effect. What we do is we survey herds that have higher and herds that have lower levels of mortality, and we compare that with other attributes of the farm. And what we find is that herds with certain management, we've got probably 50 such types of data points, um, certain attributes have higher mortality levels. It's important to realize that one thing does not cause the other. In other words, feeding the higher levels of TMR is not what kills the cows. We can't say that. The data cannot be used to that end. It just says, here are circumstances. My guess is, with that said, that if you looked across many of the features that we see in high mortality farms, that they tend to follow along with higher levels of intensity of production. And so the farms that feed TMRs are typically also the farms that have larger size. They typically are the herds that have greater number of cows per employee. They typically are more industrialized. They typically are more um, equipment oriented. In other words, there's a whole bunch of features that go in to probably something much more subtle, something like this herd is paying more attention to certain management features and less attention to the individual needs of individual cows. That's the best answer I could give you. Um, okay, very good. Now, another question. In what percent of the crops, necropsies is it not possible to determine the cause of death once you've done it? In our experience, in terms of actually giving a specific cause of death only about three or four percent. That begs the question a little differently though. If you now ask, so um, why did that cow die? Not just what was an official diagnosis, but what led to the, that particular cause of death? That's a little bit more complex. I would suggest still that probably 90 plus percent of cows, if you look at them, take time to talk with the owners, the manager, or the workers, you will come up with reasons why a cow's ended up in a circumstance in the vast majority of the time. But it will not be 100%. There will always be certain deaths that you shrug your shoulders, shake your head, and say, wow, wonder why the heck that happened. Um, probably in human medicine with autopsies and all of the advanced diagnostics, they can come up with some reasons we can't at the field level. And so we need to accept that in a field-based practice, there will be a certain rate that we don't see. But I would estimate that probably at maybe 5%. Very interesting uh, question, comment. Are there training resources available for farm workers to learn to diagnose, record health issues that causes the cow to be culled before they die? Uh, many times we cull because of lobotic discorm, uh, uh, lo locomotion, etc., without really knowing the underlying cause. Comments? Ideas? Well, I, if I understood the question correctly, I, I think what I heard was, are there ways to train the on-farm personnel better to be identifying whether it's sick cows or cows that, that aren't going to do well following treatment and it should be cold rather than treated? And I don't think there's any specific training program that does that. Um, in a different talk, well, I, I would emphasize things that go to what I would call worker education as opposed to worker training. I think the industry has gotten very good at training people how to do specific tasks, but there's been relatively less attention paid to the magic that occurs when you engage workers in truly becoming educated and investing in judgment calls and how things work with individual cows. And I think the answer to that is lies at the level of the herd veterinarian and the herd manager really working to always mentor the, the people working with the cows to improve their level of judgment. Because there aren't absolute answers, most of those types of things are judgment calls. So it requires an ongoing commitment to a team effort that looks at how decisions are made about cows and there isn't a single resource that will get that done. Okay, another interesting question. Our animals seem to be lasting less lactations, even in herds that have low death losses. Is this a bad thing, or are we just keying in on quality of life of our cows and calling them before that quality is lowered? Hmm. Yeah, there's a good question. You know, I, um, I don't have a, a great answer to that question. 
I believe that our emphasis over time in culling as a, the, the, the sense that culling is just a normal practice on dairies and so it's all a part of maintaining an efficient dairy, that will be true under certain circumstances. But it will be not true under other circumstances where, for example, there are health issues on the farm and so on, and that's what's actually limiting cow productivity and cow longevity on the farm. I think anybody listening to this has probably been to other dairies, and, and I have, where I see some dairies that have just a remarkable track record of having long-lived cows. They make the decision on when cows leave. They make the decision on why cows leave. And I go to other dairies where they have the same level of turnover and they have shorter-lived cows that need to leave because they won't survive if they stay on the farm. So I don't think across the industry one could just say we have shorter numbers of lactations and younger cows specifically because of health or specifically because of decision-making because I think it varies from farm to farm. What I would do is encourage all producers to be in the the place where they make the decision on when cows leave farm because of economic efficiencies and productivity because almost all your cows are healthy and not be the producer who has to cull cows because there's something seriously wrong. What, uh, what uh, do you have this? What is the average age of dairy cows when they, you know, on dairy farms, especially on large farms versus small farms versus organic farms? Is, you know, what, is, what is the average typical age on a dairy farm and is there a target that we should be thinking about? Great question. And simple answer is, I don't know. I should know. That would be a great thing for me to know. But I actually haven't asked that question in comparing. In Colorado, we don't have that many organic farms, so I would need to look at a different data set to compare organic versus grass-fed versus conventional versus free stall. Um, I'd have to pursue that. I don't really know the answer to that question. Yes, that would be a great thing to know because it would suggest differences between those, manage, those management systems that maybe would be informative about changes that could be made in the ones that don't have as, as long-lived cows. I do know that the average lactation, lactational life of cows is less than it used to be. And you can see that on most farms by recognizing that somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 percent of a cow inventory on most farms today are first lactation cows. That means that obviously fewer of the cows are older and uh, culling rates increase as you move to the second, the third, and the fourth lactations. But to give you a specific number and then compare it between different styles of operation, I can't do that right now. That kind of begs another question, and is, is there an optimal culling rate that we should have in the U.S.? I know you get to some pasture-based systems, and they are very critical of us in the U.S. because we are turning cows so rapidly. And then a group that says, well, that's because we got the best genetics coming in the herd as well. Any comments on that? Um, I think for some herds, that last answer, it's because of uh, good genetics. That will be true. There are definitely herds where it is true that you are turning cows over because you have better cows coming in. And I know a number of people with herds characterized that way. I think there are other farms where that is not true, where the reason there's turnover is because there has to be turnover because the management system doesn't allow the people to maintain cows long. Um, but you know, the, both of those dodge are really uh, in, uh, an important point. If, if all cows lasted longer in the herd, then our national dairy herd would probably be at 15 million cows as opposed to what it is. So at some level, the turnover rate is, is not just a matter of um, when cows have to leave, but also a function of the national herd size. Where I'd like to see the dairy industry is that we control the herd size because we make decisions about when we cull cows to send them to slaughter as opposed to we have to lose cows because we can't keep them on the farm longer. And I don't think either of those is uniform across the industry. I think um, that's very diverse from farm to farm. I hope that answer made sense. Uh, if we do necropsy, should we be taking samples and sending them to labs to identify organisms, or, or do we have to do any of that, or how do you fit that into the protocol? Oh, great question. Um, in our studies, we have only felt the need to send diagnostic lab samples on probably about 5% of the cases. What that means is 
that about 95% of the time, and certainly maybe 90% of the time, I think would be a reasonable level to expect, we can find out what we need to find out to make appropriate decisions on that farm and to attribute a cause of death without the need for additional diagnostic lab sampling. On a small percentage, we find it's important to know something more about the pathogen. And a good example might be that you see enteritis in a cow, meaning a, you know, a gut infection, and you say, I need to know if this is salmonella. Well, the only way to know that is to submit the, the sample to the lab. Okay, um, But that probably is the minority of cases. And adequate diagnoses that allow a producer to make good decisions can be made 90% of the time without additional cost of laboratory sampling. And laboratory sampling is high utility probably in a maybe 5-10% of cases. We have one more question and one comment. The question you probably touched on already, uh, uh, Dr. Frank, uh, and that is uh, from Columbia. We have pasture-based dairy here, and lately we started to use a TMR. Which diet is safer for our cows? I noticed the TMR was starting to affect mortality. Here we have long-lasting cows. Comment? <laughs> Boy, that's a tricky question. I, again, um, in the studies that have been done that identify an association between TMR feeding and death loss, be careful to understand that that is not a cause and effect. That is two attributes of dairies that are related. And the question is, why are they related? And that's not easy to tell with that study design. Um, so it probably is influenced by what we would cause, call confounding, meaning that both of those things are true on those farms, that they feed TMRs and that, that mortality rates are maybe higher, but they are related in a way that is not cause and effect. They may be related to some other feature which was not measured. Mm -hmm. Regarding whether you move to TMRs or pasture-based, I think there is something good about both. Pasture-based systems provide a lot more exercise, sunlight, fresh air, low disease prevalence on most dairies. It's a very desirable system. It's, it's after all the way cows evolved. I love pasture-based dairies. On the other hand, I love well-fed cows, and TMRs provide an opportunity to really make sure that the nutritional program is really, really good. So a well-managed TMR is a real benefit to the cow. So the issue is not whether one or the other I think is superior. I believe the issue is whether one or the other is, is managed properly. There are great farms that are pasture-based. There are great farms that are TMR-based. The difference, I believe, is in the management, not in the fact that there is one versus the other. That would be my personal conviction. Well, we'll, we'll end up with this uh, comment that comes from Wagenen University, and it's a great comment, Gary. Maybe you want to build on it, uh, uh, Frank, a little bit. And that is, the dairy industry probably has less and less workers who really recognize the problems of their cows in a stage that they can still be cured and corrected. I think this is the main reason why we end up with shorter living cows. More attention and experience should be an answer of farm staff. Interesting. That is interesting, and, and I, my observations would agree with that. One of the liabilities that we get as we industrialize the system, meaning that we do move towards more mechanized things or larger scales and scopes of, of things, we can house more cows in a, a particular on a particular dairy, and so dairy size grows. Is that um, two things happen? One, there are fewer workers, which is a, a good thing from a financial economic. Um, but second, that few, even yet fewer of those workers are really, really knowledgeable about cows and how they behave and how you recognize disease. And I think the way to combat that is not to rewind the clock and pretend that we're someplace back in the 1950s, but rather to develop better systems that encourage the workers to really pay attention to the cows, to really understand what it is they're seeing, and to really recognize when cows need a greater level of attention or some kind of special care. And that could be because of disease or it could be because of a, pre a predisposition to disease. Those things are not easy to do, and I think they require a level of management attention and a real team effort focused on the veterinarian, the manager, the owner, and the worker working together to say, can we do better than we have in the past? Um, if we don't do that and we have people who are not as capable of identifying sick cows or needy cows, then I think predictably we won't have as good individual cow care, and I think that is critical. The individual is who, who experiences what's going on in the farm. 
the individual cap. So I do believe there's a real need for ongoing good worker education and training. Well, Dr. Gary Frank, thanks a million. A great, great, great seminar. I'll turn it back to Abby for any closing comments, and uh, we'll wrap her up. Thanks, Mike. Again, thank you to Dr. Gary for a great presentation, and thank you to all of you out in the audience for tuning in and joining us today for this webinar. I want to remind you to mark your calendars for our next webinars, which will take place on Monday, December 8th, focusing on winter milk quality and utter health. And then looking into next year, January 12th, we'll have Mike Hutchins speaking to us about feeding cows for transition success. The webinars always take place on um, the second Monday at noon central time. And until then, I'd like to say farewell to all of you from us here at Hordes Dairyman and the University of Illinois.